Hello, my name is Bart Lewis and I would like to welcome you to the LDS research session of the virtual Marfan conference. During this presentation, I will elaborate on the expanding genetic basis of Lewis Dietz syndrome. As you are all probably aware, in 2005, we described for the first time a condition which is now called Lewis Dietz syndrome based on the occurrence of a typical triad of hypertelorism or widely spaced eyes, the presence of cleft palate or a bifid uvula, and a bifid uvula should be considered as the minimal clinical expression of a, a cleft palate, along with arterial tortuosity, widespread and severe early onset aortic aneurysms and dissections. Soon after the initial description, we expanded the phenotype to a less syndromic form of um, Lewis Dietz syndrome, in which many uh, patients do present connective tissue findings, but not always the severe craniofacial findings as we initially presented in the Lewis Dietz syndrome. Since the initial discovery, we identified six genes underlying the phenotype of Lewis Dietz syndrome. Initially, the first two described forms, the syndromic and less syndromic form, were described as type 1 and type 2. But after the discovery of multiple genes, we started numbering the different subtypes of LDS according to the underlying gene, with LDS type 1 corresponding to TJ beta receptor 1, LDS2 corresponding to TJ beta receptor 2, type 3 to SMAT3, type 4 to TJ beta 2, type 5 to TJ beta 3, and type 6 to SMAT2. As you can see, all these genes encode for proteins that form a signaling cascade, which involves the cytokines outside of the cell, including TJ beta 2 and 3, the receptors, receptor 1 and 2, and the downstream effectors of the TJ beta signaling SMAT2 and 3, which go to the nucleus to influence gene expression. All these genes so far inherit in an autosomal dominant fashion, meaning that there is a 50% chance of transmitting it to the next generation or are the consequence of a de novo mutation. Over the years, we have learned that there is a disease spectrum with on one hand the syndromic presentations with many systemic features and young age of onset with early onset dissections and at the other end a milder expression with less systemic features and also occurrence of non-penetrance which means that you can carry the gene mutation without having any phenotype at all. When we have to order the genes according to this scheme, TJ beta receptor 1 and 2 and SMAT3 are at a more severe end with regards to cardiovascular presentation and TJ beta 2, SMAT2 and uh, TJ beta 3 at the milder end. For example, in TJ beta 3 families, we know that more than 50% of the mutation carriers do not carry a phenotype. Today, I would like to share with you for the first time a new autosomal recessive syndromic TA presentation. Autosomal recessive means it does not imply a difference between males and females. And recessive refers to the fact that for an individual to be affected, it needs to carry a mutation in both copies of the gene. So in most cases, one inherited from the father, one inherited from the mother, and only if you have two mutations, you present with the disease. In total, we identified uh, six families in which this recessive presentation was present. 
how does the phenotype of those patients look like? It does resemble uh, Louis Dietz like findings. As we noticed, typical findings including the widely spaced eyes or hypertelorism, the cleft palate, and bifitubula. But there is also many skeletal findings, including pectus deformities, such as the pectus excavatum, the cervical spine anomalies, as we do observe them in about one third of the LDS patients, long fingers or arachnodactyly, and joint hypermobility. Most patients also develop of or present a motor developmental delay, uh, probably related to a neuromuscular hypotonia. From a cardiovascular perspective, those patients also present at young age, uh, with in our study age ranges between 4 and 19. They have quite pronounced aortic aneurysms, both at the level of the root, just coming out of the heart, and the ascending aorta. So far, no dissections have been observed, but this could be linked to the young age of our patients. Similar to LDS patients with mutations in other genes, they present aneurysms at other spots at the side branches of the aorta, and they have congenital cardiovascular anomalies such as atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, and patent ductus arteriosus. So far, only two patients have been extensively been imaged, and they also showed similar arterial and aortic tortuosity. So what's the gene underlying this condition? Well, it's called IPO8, and it encodes for Importin8. As you can see on this diagram, mutations affect the whole gene, and most often lead to what we call an early stop coding, stop codon, which would lead to the fact that these patients do not make normal importin 8 at all. So the function, it belongs to a large family, and so far no human conditions have been linked to this uh, group of proteins. Um, it has a function in importing cargo from the cytoplasm across the nuclear membrane, include, indicated here in purple, to the nucleus. In order to better study the function, uh, we created uh, mice in which we could look at the possible cargos. In the literature, SMAT proteins have been reported as potential cargos. First, we did extensive cardiovascular imaging and we showed that uh, mice lacking this protein do develop aneurysms both at the root and the ascendance and there seemed to be a male predisposition. So the males do develop worse aneurysms mostly at the ascending compared to females, although females also develop it. Similarly, we only observed aortic dissection and rupture in three homozygous mutant males between age 32 and 46 weeks. We also studied the effect of the mutations on the behavior of the aortic wall. And we were able to show that these aortas of the mutant mice presented a stiffer ascending aorta. And this was not related to an increased basal tone or sustained vascular smooth muscle contraction, but rather seemed to be the consequence of a passive stiffness of the ascending aorta. This hints to a problem in the extracellular matrix. And indeed, we were able to show that compared to wild type, mutant mice present with elastic fiber fragmentation and more disorganized elastic fibers and um, they also presented a signature of increased tj beta signaling as shown here by the dark brown nuclei that present overactive phosphorylated smat2 which is an effector of the tj beta signaling this finding of increased TJ-beta signaling was further demonstrated 
by the expression pattern of genes in the aortic wall, in which typical genes that are TGA-beta dependent, such as CTGF and matrix metalloproteinase, were upregulated. So, in summary, we've shown that mutations in IPO8 show a phenotype that has resemblance to Lewis Dietz syndrome with early onset TAA. The mouse model nicely recapitulates what is seen in humans, and our first functional studies hint towards a pathophysiological mechanism that has been previously been described. As our newly discovered gene is downstream of all the previously identified genes, it represents a unique target for therapeutic intervention. I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, the research team in Antwerp for these very exciting new discoveries.